I wonder if anybody out there in the audience has any idea if any recording artist has ever spoken about sucking paper mache. If anybody has that valuable information, if you could please get back to me. Or perhaps you can relay that message to me through Charles Manson. Are you ready to roll? Are you ready to roll? My name is. Oh God, I forgot what my name is. Let me take a look at my license. Oh my God, I lost my wallet. I'm not going to know who I am. I need some help. I need some answers fast. Like, who am I? How is the universe created? If God is good, how can there be evil in the world? And last but not least, who is number one in the automotive glass replacement industry? Uh, I was a big fan of the Beatles and the Stones and uh, the Monkees I liked. Uh, I liked uh, Sebastian. What's his name? Peter Sebastian? Uh, the uh, Loving Spoonful, and I like the Mamas and the Papas, and I liked a lot of bands. Those were the chief ones, and then I decided to get together with a few people that were introduced to me by different people that had bands, so I was playing in a few bands, putting together some rudimentary material. This was back in 66, 67. What high school? Uh, that, no, that was in uh, Brandeis University. Because oh. I graduated Newton High School, class of 1965. In case nobody picked this up, a lot of the songs that I've been involved with are allegories. An allegory is when you say something that has a hidden meaning. It's a meaning that's hidden. It's like a mask covering somebody's face. And then when they take off the mask, the true meaning of the song reveals itself. Like when I take off my mask and everybody discovers that I'm really a hideous skeleton. I think that I will see you later. I don't want to be eaten by an alligator. involved and I forget what they called themselves. The wild men or the walled men or something like that. And they did a lot of uh, Motown type of stuff and I eventually just kind of got tired of it and we split up. They went on to do Top 40 and uh, do small shows and I just wasn't into that. So that's when I joined in with the original site called Schmuck. And it's named after somebody who is a schmuck. 
I would imagine that sometime in your life you might have encountered a person that was called a schmuck. Haven't you? is the place recording studio on Boylston Street in Boston with Herbie Yakis and his brother and we recorded Till the Stroke of Dawn on a single and that's the one that became a jukebox classic so oh, called. And Shelley Yakis. Right. Shelley did the raspberry. Oh right on. Wow. Yeah. So uh, that was uh, in all the college jukeboxes till the stroke of dawn by the psychopaths, the hit. original. That was a hit. Count Dracula. I like the Count Dracula movies, so I decided to kind of write a song about Count Dracula with couched lyrics and see if anybody could figure out that that's actually what the song was being written about. <laughs>
when he was in the band called The Dots with Tom Kerwin and a fellow by the name of Jace and uh, well what, what we did was uh, we got together at this big farmhouse in Hanover and uh, did that's where they were living they had a studio set up there and uh, we did a lot of homemade type recording stuff uh, with Robert Holmes uh, and uh, we Steve, didn't the band the teeth ah uh, yeah that was the band uh, the teeth uh, the other band the name that they were using was the dots and they were into uh, top 40 type of things they did their own original type of stuff and uh, their uh, did you record with them at all Yes, I did, mm -hmm. and a lot of the stuff that we did is um, Eric Lindgren has it, and he hasn't really done anything with it yet. One of the songs is on the upcoming CD, the redone version of uh, Best Time is one of them, mm. and uh, some of the others that we did, Sylvia, that was on my first CD when we redid that one. Yeah. That's a good song. And we were together uh, basically until right before I got married. I was married 11 years. I didn't play in a band. Why? I had too much going on, too many responsibilities, uh, business to run family to raise, all that type of stuff. Okay, ready? Yeah. I like Greek literature, especially stuff about Agamemnon and Menelaus and the Trojan Wars. That was about condoms, right? Yeah, that was. The Trojan Wars was all about condoms. Somebody decided to eliminate the condom supply, so there was a shortage of condominiums, and it caused real estate prices to soar. 
up a lot of the songs that I've been involved with are allegories. An allegory is when you say something that has a hidden meaning. It's a meaning that's hidden. It's like a mask covering somebody's face. And then when they take off the mask, the true meaning of the song reveals itself. Like when I take off my mask and everybody discovers that I'm really a hideous skeleton. I didn't hear the vocals in there. All right, but your stuff's in there. It's in there. Um, do you need to hear all the vocals? Well, if I don't, I might be out of timing. Okay, let me, let me get those choruses up. Where do you go when you have to sue somebody when you're electrocuted? You go to the short circuit court of appeals. Ha <laughs> ha! Okay, now in this particular movie. It was a semi-documentary movie and it was produced by my ex-girlfriend's brother. It was shot uh, mostly at a farmhouse in Concord, Massachusetts. They had a full film crew, a lot of very sophisticated equipment, uh, people that were acting in it, and it was pretty much a critique on Christianity. Uh, little did I know uh, the motivation behind it at the time. And when I became involved with the project, I thought it was just a spoof or comedy routine. It kind of worked out very well, and everybody in the film crew and all the other actors and everybody, my ex-girlfriend and her brother and everybody else were very impressed with my performance on that movie. Now, uh, what happened to throw the whole thing out of whack was uh, one evening, we're talking like 2 a.m., we're shooting this scene on North Street in Concord, and all of a sudden, uh, squad cars show up from the Concord Police Department and they arrested the whole bunch of us. Evidently there were complaints that we were disturbing the peace, shining bright lights on the street, so they gathered us all up and brought us down to the police station uh, where we were all put in, I was put in a separate cell, I know that, and I was grilled for about four hours. They wouldn't let me out of there. And they were asking me all kinds of questions, which were just pretty much beyond belief. They were asking me about whether I was involved with devil worship, whether I was involved with attempting to poison a water supply, how well I knew these people, and uh, from the bent of their questioning, they kind of gave me the impression that they thought that I was one of the key members of this group, who I later found out were a bunch of devil worshippers, and that they were doing all kinds of very unsavory things. And they were trying to spread uh, the disease of spinal meningitis by doing something to the water supply. That was one of the allegations. All right, behind me we have the satellite for the Marlboro Hospital. And this is the building in which I was held captive by the devil worshippers who were also medical professionals who worked in that building. Now, when I lived with them in Concord, they drugged me and took me over to this facility, the satellite of the Marlboro Hospital, and um, one of them, Brother John, was my doctor 
at that hospital and he kept me doped up with Thorazine and uh, the purpose of that was so they could get me to sign my will over in duress to my ex-girlfriend who was Brother John's sister. So right now we are on Main Street in Marlboro at the corner of Florence Street and right here on a cold night at 2 a.m. at this very location is where I broke up with my ex-girlfriend. My ex-girlfriend I had found out was a devil worshiper and everybody called her Sister Mary. Now Sister Mary broke up with me right over here. I was standing here show the crosswalk and the crosswalk Sister Mary was walking down this sidewalk right over here and heading toward me and the date was March 8th 2008 it was a, a Saturday night at 2 o'clock in the morning and I was here and Sister Mary walk over, walked over to me and said I guess I'll just add this disaster to my list of past disasters. And I think one of the reasons that she wanted to break up with me, with me is because I decided to rat her out, her and her brother and all their friends, as being devil worshippers who were involved in a lot of clandestine activities such as poisoning water supplies and stuff like that. Uh, of course, I didn't realize that when I got mixed up with that crew, but. That's why Sister Mary, right here, decided to break up with me and tell me I'll add this disaster to my list of past disasters. Your police have my disavowal. You probably hope that I get disavowal. down Main Street Marlboro now and I received a call on the night of March 8th 2008 from Brother Paul and Brother Paul told me to meet him on Main Street Marlboro and he had something extremely urgent that he needed to tell me about my ex-girlfriend, Sister Mary. Now, Brother Paul was one of the devil worshippers. So he called me up and he said, meet me at 2 a.m. in Marlboro Square. And we're heading to the location where I met Brother Paul. I didn't realize it at the time, but when I left the satellite for the Marlboro Hospital, I had been drugged with some kind of Thorazine derivative, which was slow-acting. So after about 
a half hour or so, the drug started to kick in and I was not able to move very well. My speech became slurred and I was pretty much incapacitated. And then when I got to a location right around here, at the end of this block of stores, Brother Paul was sitting in his car and he was waiting for me. And he had a really sick scenario in store for me. Right over here at this corner, this is South Bolton Road, which is actually Route 85. And right over here at this corner, at this parking lot, is where I met Brother Paul. Now Brother Paul pulled up right over here next to this pole and this is where he was. His car pulled up right here and this is where I was standing. So Brother Paul rolled down the window of his car right here and he said, Dave, I don't know if I told you this, but one of the things I do professionally is I train attack dogs. And right here in the front seat of my car is a trained Doberman attack dog. And I train this dog to kill people by ripping their balls off. And now because of what you did to us, I'm going to have this dog get you and I was incapacitated. I really couldn't run, couldn't do much of anything. And it was two o'clock in the morning of the night of March 8th. The only thing I was able to do is I was able to stumble into the street like this. And I fell down right in the middle of the street and luckily there was a passing motorist there. And uh, the passing motorist saw what was going on, saw the dog going after me, and called uh, 911 on his cell phone. And shortly thereafter, the police was down here, and then Brother Paul and his dog took off. So that was uh, the end of that story. Then I was pretty much incapacitated, so the police drove me back to the satellite of the Marlboro Hospital and I kept saying no 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 don't take me there because that's where the devil worshippers are that's where uh, brother John is and they're gonna kill me if you send me back there of course the police thought I was crazy so they took me back there anyway because it was the nearest hospital and then after they uh, worked on me a bit uh, brother John and uh, his cohorts threw me in their car and drove me off in this direction where they had the episode of the bells. Now when you're talking about bells, bells have a major significance somehow when it has to do with the devil worship because bells are very important to devil worshippers. The ordeal of the bells, for whom the bell tolls. There's the bell. The bell tolls for me. Ernest Hemingway, for whom the bell tolls. And we're going to talk all about bells now. Because if I was able to survive the ordeal of the bells, then the devil worshippers were going to let me alone. They were going to set me free. So, a bunch of them, maybe about five or six people, all dressed in very uh, uh, colonial outfits is the only way I can describe This is the park where the devil worshippers took me 
at approximately 2.30 a.m. on the morning of March 8, 2008. And they took me right in here. And behind you, you see a church, which I believe is the first congregational church of Marlboro. And right here is John Brown's Bell. And this is John Brown's Bell, who was named after the abolitionist John Brown. Now, one of the devil worshippers got up into this tower and started ringing the bell while they took me right over here, right near this tree is where they had me. And there were other people here ringing bells. And this is where they were going to do me in. But for whatever reason, I guess the drug wore off or something, I was able to get away from them. And I started running in that direction over to the Dunkin' Donuts. So I ran over to the Dunkin' Donuts, I got inside of there, and then I told the people there to get the police right away. So the police came and got me, and I explained the situation to me, and eventually they took me to the police station, and I uh, testified about what had happened, and that was the end of the ordeal for me. The end. Sister Mary, that song was just for you. How do you like them apples?